very fortunate to have two women in my life who continue to love me absolutely, who care about me, who watch over me, and who provide me with everything I need. But here's the thing. These two women are dead, and I still continue to communicate with them. The first one is my mother. My mother was the most kind and loving, generous and nurturing woman I've ever known, and she gave great hugs. And when I was 15, she died. And even now, it's very hard for me to put into words exactly how enormous that loss was for me. At her funeral, a friend of the family came up to me and said, you know, I really miss your mom. And you know, I like to talk to Edna. And I thought to myself, oh my God, you are crazy. <laughs> As the years went by, it was a funny thing. I began to notice that my mom would send me messages and communications. And she would send me signs. And when I, <clears throat> and I have been without my mom for 40 years, and I miss her every day. But the most acute, one of the most acute times that I missed her was when I was pregnant with my first child, because I just wanted to share that experience with her. And my mom, being my mom, sent me a second mother. And she sent me a woman named Carol Mahoney. And Honey was a savior for me. We called her Honey because my oldest daughter, Asia, when she was a year old, took Carol Mahoney's whole name and shrunk it in toddler speak to Honey. And Honey she was ever since. Honey had a shock of white hair and a beautiful Irish complexion. And she was kind of a cross between Mary Poppins and Maria in the Sound of Music and Snow White. Like, if you can imagine someone who had these characteristics where everything around her always was full of magic and a surprise and an adventure, and you never knew what was going to happen. And she loved us absolutely. She championed me like a mother would, and she loved my two daughters like a grandmother would, fiercely and protectively. She had, we had a tradition in our house that we loved, and it was called Honey Days. And Honey Days were the days that she would take my two daughters, either one or both of them, and she would wash them for me for the day. And Honey Days were like, anything can happen Thursday, and your birthday and Christmas Eve all rolled into one. <laughs> so Honey Days for them might include a trip to Noni's to sit at the lunch counter and have a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich on oatmeal toast. It might be a trip to Sheeling Forest to play poo sticks over the little bridge. And many, many Honey Days involve trips to the dump. And occasionally, keys got locked in cars and dramatic rescues ensued. And in the fall of 2005, Carol Mahoney was diagnosed with stage 4 ovarian cancer. And we knew our Honey Days were coming to an end. And I knew I was going to lose another mother. And in the spring, Carol Mahoney passed away. And my family was devastated. The hardest times for me were in the morning. I would drop my children off at school. My husband, Vinny, would be at work. And I would drive home, get out of the car, and walk straight to my backyard and sit down and sob and sob and sob. And one day I looked up, and across our pond is a dead tree. And sitting in that dead tree was a hawk. And I thought to myself, Carol Mahoney is sending me a sign. And then I said to myself, hmm, I actually don't think that's right. I think that is Carol Mahoney. <laughs> <laughs> because if you knew Carol, she had this calming presence. And the minute I stood there and saw that hawk, I started to calm down a little. And it reassured me. And I felt like she was with me. Because Carol Mahoney's manner, when you were around her, was kind of like Valium for your soul. You just relaxed. The hawk stayed with me in that tree for three months. And then it began the parade of animals. Now here's what I mean by that. For whatever reason, 
I think Carol thought we needed some reassurance and possibly some distraction. So for the next several months, animals appeared in our yard all the time. We had pileated woodpeckers, we had peregrine falcons, and for a very long time, we had two bobcats that sat in our backyard and didn't want to leave. And I often thought of her like Snow White when she was alive because pets would come to her and animals would come to her. Our pets in our house would fall all over each other trying to get to her when she came in the front door. And they would lay in her lap and look up at her loving. She had a way with the natural world and I felt like she was sending it to us and our backyard looked like Mutual of Omaha's wild hair. <laughs> <laughs> and then one of the other things Pony did for us was before she died, she gave us a gift. And she gave us a trip to Agunquit, Maine, to a beautiful inn that overlooks the Marginal Way. And the Marginal Way is that beautiful footpath that goes from the town of Agunquit all the way across the cliffs and down into the, um, to Perkins Cove where that's lobster boats. And the inn sat right up on the cliff and you looked out and there was the beautiful Atlantic Ocean and then there was also the crystal blue tidal river. And about a year after Honey passed away, we felt healed enough to use that gift. So we went out and the morning we were packing, my husband said to all of us, let's all grab a crystal because Honey loved crystals. Let's grab one of ours, each grab a special crystal and we will put it somewhere on the marginal way to honor and remember her. So the next morning, that's what we did. We spent the morning deciding and placing them in the, on, the, in the, on the beach, in the ocean, on the cliffs, and as soon as we did that, the stones started coming. Here's what I mean by that. My husband was sitting enjoying a cup of coffee. He looks down at the arm of the Adirondack chair in which he's sitting, and he realizes there's a stone there. So he picks it up, and it's a black stone. And on it are, in the, are the words, in beautiful white lettering, love is not scarce, with two hearts written on it. He was floored. I was floored. The kids came over, they were extremely excited. They looked at it and they said, it's got to be from Honey, and it looks like her writing, which it, it actually did. <laughs> a few minutes later, my oldest daughter, Asia, was walking, and under a bush she picked up a stone, and it was painted turquoise blue, and on it were the words, be you. Now, if you knew my daughter, my quirky, funny, unusual older daughter. Pony celebrated that and loved that about her. A few minutes later, my younger daughter picks up from beside the marginal way a green stone, and on it are painted in those same beautiful white letters, use those wings. Because Honey often called my youngest daughter an angel, a cherub, her little fairy sprite. Pony believed that Kylie flitted around the earth spreading magic and wonderful things. Of course she would write that on that rock. And then Kylie looked up at me, she was about six at the time with her big eyes, and she said, but mama, you don't have a rock. <laughs> and I was about to say, don't worry about it, as mothers do. And we both looked, and there, on one of the benches that lined the marginal way, was a rock. And I knew it was my rock. But it was also about three inches from a woman's derriere, and I was a little uncomfortable about going around. <laughs> Kylie's like this, like, I'm gonna go get it. And I am thinking to myself, please, lady, just get up and walk away. I don't want to have to wrestle you for that, but I will. <laughs> she luckily walked up, got up, walked off, nod backward glance, and Kylie scooted in and grabbed the rock and brought it over to me proudly. And it was painted green just like hers, and on it were the words, rejoice, with an exclamation point. You see, Honey knew our hearts, and she knew that when my heart is filled with joy, I'm at my most self-expressed. So the four of us are standing there on the edge of the marginal way with these rocks, and we're looking at them. Vinny and I are looking at each other like, oh my God, holy crap, what just happened? <laughs> And the girls are really excited because although kids, as a rule, are pretty used to magical things happening, that's kind of their thing, this was still pretty special to them. So I'm looking at them and I'm trying to quantify it in my head and justify it. I'm thinking, are there little? 
new age artsy craftsy women running all around the marginal way, throwing the stones out for them. <laughs> but that's not happening. We're noticing that everybody is doing their tourist thing, and we're the only ones with these rocks. We're sitting there, it's almost like in our own little bubble, having our own little moment. And I looked at those rocks and I realized a couple things. That Carol Mahoney was Mary Poppins. That like Mary Poppins, she was with us when we most needed her, and then she floated away. And I also realized that I had become the crazy person who talks to dead people. <laughs> and what's even worse, they talk back to me, loudly. It was the best Tony day of all. Thank you.